Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Why Agile Marketing Doesn't Mean Chaos. Uh, my name is Ed Brialt uh, from Aprimo and we're joined by uh, an awesome company, uh, Agile Sherpas. Um, as you know, this is uh, the fourth webinar in our Mind the Gap series. Previously, we talked about um, organizational design. We, we talked about organizational disruption uh, in order to um, drive more efficiencies and create more um, digital centric organizations and customer experience minded organizations. And then we also talked about uh, building the MarTech stack uh, as part of um, as part of all of that. Today, we're going to talk about agile marketing. And um, so I'm really excited. Two awesome presenters, uh, two thought leaders have jo are joining us today. Uh, we're going to talk about agile marketing, the big A in agile, little a, uh, really demystifying a lot of the terminology and what it means to bring this new business discipline into the marketing organization, this new mindset the, with new processes and, uh, and tools and ways of working. And it's just the next, the new uh, next uh, discipline that uh, organizations need to look at in order to advance uh, at the speed at which marketing is moving today. Uh, so joining me uh, is Andrea Freirier from uh, Agile Sherpas, as well as Anjali Yakundi from Aprimo. Uh, Andrea, uh, welcome to the call and webinar. Uh, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I'm the president and lead trainer for Agile Sherpas, and we are one of the only companies in the world that focuses on helping marketing teams go agile. Uh, I am certified in agile coaching and agile leadership and also scrum mastering and product ownership, and as well as I have, have a uh, little over a decade of marketing experience. So lots of uh, sort of disparate things coming together in my world these days, and um, we are really excited by the transformations that we're seeing with the teams we work with and in the marketing profession as a whole. Agile is definitely the way forward and we're excited to be partners with people as they make that transition. That's awesome, Andrea. And I know there's a large Agile community out there. That's where I met you um, in San Francisco last year and uh, really impressed by its Agile marketing is really it's a movement uh, as much as it is now becoming a uh, broadly adopted business discipline. So thank you for joining us today. Um, and Anjali, how about you introduce yourself as well? Absolutely. Thanks, Ed. Um, so really excited to be here and uh, hear a little bit more about what Andrew has to say about Agile and add in some of the Aprimo thoughts. Um, I'm a product marketing director at Aprimo. Um, I look after um, primarily our products around digital asset management and um, marketing work management. So very excited to hear what she said. Before um, I joined Aprimo, I was uh, in the analyst space um, at Forrester Research, covering areas around uh, marketing technology and digital asset management. So really excited to be here and uh, excited to have everyone. That's awesome, Anjali. And you're a master multitasker, too, because I can see you're already blowing up Twitter, <laughs> which is great. So, hey, this is exciting. Let's, uh, let's advance. Uh, Andrea, do you want to take it away from here? Yeah, absolutely. So I always like to start this with a little bit of what's in it for me, uh, talking about the benefits that marketing departments can see following an agile transformation, because it's not easy to go agile, especially if you're sort of starting from a full stop and then transitioning to full agile is not an easy thing to do. So I like to start off by proving that it's totally going to be worth it. Uh, these results that you're seeing here are from our shiny new 2018 State of Agile Marketing report where we surveyed hundreds of marketers and we asked the ones who have already gone through an Agile transformation what benefits they saw. And you can see there's a wide variety here. Everything from that first ability to change gears quickly based on incoming feedback, um, because of course nothing ever changes in marketing. We don't ever need to pivot. And uh, I love the, uh, particularly the improved team morale because happy marketers produce better work, which is always good. And more effective prioritization of work. So agile teams are more likely to work on the right things at the right time. Of course, we see the faster time to get things released because that's what you would expect from an agile transformation. But there's a lot of good stuff that comes out of going agile. And let's make sure, there we go. Um, one thing that I was surprised by in our State of Agile Marketing report, however, was how much of a difference 
agile team, how much more likely agile teams were to place this uh, focus on quality. So when we segmented our results, you can see we asked people whether they would categorize themselves as an ad hoc team that doesn't do much planning, an agile team, or a traditional team that does a lot of planning up front and then just tries to stick to that plan over time. Agile teams are telling us, 68% of agile teams are saying that they prioritize quality work. An ad hoc team is only almost 47% with a focus on quality, which I find amazing in the world that we're marketing in right now where quality is the only way to go. That's the only way for us to engage with audiences that are so jaded and so overwhelmed with the amount of messaging that they receive. Agile, I think, gives us a much better chance of getting through to them. Sorry, I'm getting used to this advancement is taking there. All right. um, so when we talk about Agile, when we talk about the process of changing the way that we approach marketing, things like this are often what come to people's mind. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, I saw another article holding this tweet out as the ultimate example of Agile marketing. And you may remember this. It's hard to believe that it happened over five years ago now, but this is the Oreo dunk in the dark tweet during the blackout of the Super Bowl. Some clever marketer over at Oreo was quick behind the keyboard and posted this tweet. And of course, the internet went crazy and was so impressed with how on the ball and uh, relevant this tweet was in the moment. However, I do have to uh, push back a little bit on all of the praise and accolades that this tweet gets because I'm going to go ahead and say this is not Agile, not capital A Agile, not the kind of Agile that we really need to be embracing in order to fix our broken processes and to get to all of those great benefits that we saw earlier on. What this tweet is an example of is lowercase a Agile. So it was very fast. It was responsive to what was going on in the world at the time. And those are all good things. It's good for modern marketers to be nimble and adaptive. And all of those things are things we need to be. But that's not the same as what you see on the left here, that capital A, Agile. That involves things that are a little bit harder to do. It involves choosing a specific methodology and implementing it very deliberately and then continuously improving that process over time. It forces us to change our mindset to start thinking about marketing a little differently. All of this is founded on a particular set of values and principles. And then teams and leadership all behave differently inside an agile organization as well. So we're going to look at what all of that actually means here. So these are sort of the three, uh, three of the most common flavors of Agile methodologies. We have Scrum, Kanban, and Scrumbon. And these are all come with their own uh, practices and approaches, but these are sort of the three most common flavors. But when we ask uh, Agile marketing teams which flavor they prefer, it turns out that we don't actually like to pick a flavor. Uh, we would prefer to have Neapolitan ice cream, apparently, where we get to uh, draw from all the buckets. Um, again, we're looking at our 2018 State of Agile Marketing report here, and 44% of Agile marketers say they're using a hybrid of some kind. So they're uh, picking from the various approaches. And one thing that I think is really important to note here is that in order to pull from all the different approaches, you have to understand them all. So we can't just focus our education and focus our learning in a single methodology. We have to know what's out there in order to make smart choices. Well, that's super interesting, Andrea. I'm wondering, you know, when you look at all of these, so many people are using hybrid. Is there, you know, why is it that so many firms are going with hybrid approaches? And also, do you see like certain groups prefer a certain approach like within marketing? Like is some is digital marketing more likely to choose one type of approach or, you know, traditional kind of uh, media buying, they're more likely to choose another approach. Just kind of curious what kind of differences you're seeing. 
Yeah, uh, I think that the reasoning behind it is just that none of these approaches were designed for marketers or by marketers. Like we're sort of coming into these existing methodologies that were designed for software developers and trying to make them work for us. So it makes a lot of sense to me that some practices from one work well for us and some practice from another work well. And so uh, I think it's great. This uh, These results actually make me really happy that people are um, coming up with their own ways of being agile, because that's what matters, is the mindset and the benefits, not whether or not you do stand up in a particular way. Um, in terms of what sorts of teams prefer what approaches, um, what I find with the teams that I'm working with are anytime you have a creative component in the team, whether it's creative services or content or design, they tend to gravitate more on more toward the Kanban end of the spectrum because that lets them kind of break out of the time box. So they're not tied to a two week sprint. They can deliver when they want to deliver. Um, so they tend to prefer that. Whereas people who are kind of living and dying by deadlines more so like event planning and things like that, um, they feel more comfortable in scrum. So they have that, that time box actually makes them more comfortable. Um, and then of course, when you have a combination of all of that, then you start getting into more of like a traditional scrum bond or this build your own adventure um, hybrid. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, at a primo, I've seen very similar things. Um, and it's also interesting because we think of folks who are creating, you know, doing design and, you know, for digital marketing teams, there often there are developers um, in those teams as well. So that can often, you know, they're they're kind of moving. So while the developers may be used to to kind of the two week sprints, they're kind of also having to adjust um, and, and go with more of the content oriented and design oriented types of um, types of uh, a work where you're kind of delivering more in a Kanban methodology. So it's, it's really interesting to see um, all these different marketing organizations. I think the other thing that I see sometimes it's cultural. Um, you know, so sometimes, you know, certain offices or, or others, they have a certain culture that just necessarily kind of leans one way or another. So it's really interesting to me to see how they're kind of taking these, like you said, you know, developer um, approaches and really tailoring it to marketing. Yeah, yeah, the culture definitely uh, plays a role, um, which I think leads nicely into this, because if you have a culture that's already kind of way bought in on the left side here in the being agile end of the spectrum and they have an agile mindset, they understand the values and the principles, then they're willing to adopt a wider variety of practices. Whereas if you uh, are still trying to work on changing that mindset in the organization, there may be more of a uh, tendency to strictly adhere to a particular methodology. Uh, and as long as you're continuously evolving over time, either one of those is okay, but being aware of the environment that you're working in um, can help you sort of figure out where you fall on this spectrum. Uh, and certainly we want to keep our focus on being agile as much as possible. And then what does that mean for the way that we do Agile in our particular context? Because it doesn't look the same for everybody, which is totally okay. <laughs> uh, so talking of the values and principles, uh, there's a lot of them and we're not gonna go one by one through them all today, but these are the four values that are from the original Agile Manifesto. You can see the whole thing at uh, agilemanifesto.org. And there's also a marketing version at agilemarketingmanifesto.org if you're interested in sort of the translation that's happened there. But it's, it's, um, it's worth understanding kind of what's at the heart of all of the particular practices that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, I've included the, the whole piece here because it says we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. And I think this is important for marketers to understand is you don't have to know everything before you get started. It's okay to, for this to be an emergent process that you learn by doing and learn by helping other people do. So as we go through that process, then we start to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That includes the digital tools that we use to manage our work and the processes that we put in place. All of that is secondary to the individuals and interactions that happen on the team. We want working software, or in our case, working marketing campaigns, 
over comprehensive documentation. So it's more important to get something out into the world and see what our audience thinks of it than to spend months coming up with this super detailed plan. And customer collaboration is more important than contract negotiation. Again, in the world of marketing, this could be something more like customer communication is more important because we want to always keep that focus right on our customer, not necessarily on our own products and services. And then responding to change over following a plan. So planning is good. We still want to plan, but it's more important to react to what's going on around us than to blindly stick to that plan. And what this turns out to look like is a more experimental and iterative approach to marketing. So old school waterfall would be that gray dotted line that's going towards this opportunity that we think is somewhere out there in the future. But what happens in the volatile and uncertain world that we all inhabit is that the opportunity moves something happens out there in the world so that our plan is no longer going to work a marketing team however makes a series of short-term plans sees what happens and then pauses to replan and iterate and then move forward in short spurts as you can see here so their series of iterative small plans actually allows them to hit the opportunity where it moved to because they, they still do the planning, but they just do it more often and in shorter spurts. So uh, what does this actually look like? It's sort of nice to hear it as a, a theoretical concept, but what does it actually look like when we start doing marketing this way? So there's two things that need to happen. We have iterations and we have increments. So an iteration is where we add more value or more in this case, maybe beauty to something that we originally put out. So that would be the sketch at the bottom. So we started out with kind of a basic idea and then we improve it as we learn what's working and what's not until eventually over time we have something amazing. An incremental approach is where we put complete pieces together to build something amazing over time. And then each of those pieces is releasable they're done enough to be put out in front of somebody, but over time they combine to make something more than themselves. So content, I'm a content marketer by trade. That's where I started out in marketing. So that's kind of where most of my, uh, my brain goes when I'm looking for examples. But an example of how this would work in the world of content, in a waterfall approach, we would spend a whole lot of time researching, a whole lot of time writing, a whole lot of time designing, editing, getting approval, and then finally releasing. And if our content turned out to be off point or something happened in the market between the research and release phases, we're out of luck because we are committed to this piece of content. But in an iterative approach, we can actually do, we do the whole content creation process just in smaller chunks. And this allows us to release smaller pieces. And then by the end, once we've learned more about what our audience likes and what kind of content they're engaging with, we might be able to skip some of those phases and release something bigger that's a combination of these first two releases. We can release something bigger at the end. So another way to look at this might be we put out a, a little experimental test, a little short listicle, right? It's like the five most important things to do on a webinar that you're attending and see what happens and if our audience enjoys that piece of content. And then if they do, we can then expand it out even bigger. We add graphics, we add video, we create the best page on the internet about our topic. And then that does really well. And so we devote more time, more resources into this same idea and create a more graphic, an infographic, a big um, visual piece for our audience to, because that could be our theory that they have engaged with the written version. How about a graphic version? That keeps doing really well. And so then finally, we might expand out into something that requires more time, more investment, like a video series. But we wouldn't want to dive straight into the video series first without validating the idea through this incremental building up process. And an agile approach just allows us to do this systematically and with very little risk over time. And then we do I still get to this nice campaign that we were after in the first place. 
Sorry, Andrew, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just so excited about uh, <laughs> this concept. Um, I think it's really interesting because what I'm seeing, you know, the reason I got so excited is there's so many buzzwords out there in marketing right now. And I think it's like agile marketing and personalization. And um, one of the things that we started to see come up is this idea of content atomization. So like, how do you break up content in, in smaller pieces, get it out to market faster, test it? And what I love about seeing this, why I got so excited and I interrupted you, um, is that it really, it's, this is what you're showing here. It almost combines all these different buzzwords that are come out and you can really see how an organization, especially when it comes to content, you know, can get up and running really fast. Um, I know from the Aprima point of view, you know, we've even talked to customers and we've seen organizations who um, want to start so small that it's like they're going down to like paragraph level, you know, let's start and like, let's get it or tweet, you know, like so small content. And if it starts to gain traction, they're going. Uh, I think what's really cool about some of these organizations, what they're doing is the smaller they've broken down some of their content and start out so small, they can reuse it and localize it more easily. Um, they can re reuse some of that content. Like, so when you talk about starting with a listicle, you know, maybe a list, that list is almost like a part of the infographic. Um, so they're almost like reusing it too. It's not just, you know, the concept that they're building off of. It can actually be the actual copy that they're building off of. Um, so it's super exciting time, I think, in marketing. And I think we're finally starting to see after all these buzz buzzwords are coming out, um, we're starting to see like actual um, synergy between them and they're starting to move into practice. Yeah, and none of that happens by accident. It has to be very deliberate and very strategic for it to be effective. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It has to be kind of a, a, a practice. And I think I, I'm excited to hear what you have to say next because it's showing how someone actually, um, CA Technologies actually can use this in practice. Right, right. So I think it's always helpful, like you said, to see how a real life team is putting this into practice. Because um, theory is great, but things usually get messy when they encounter reality. So I want to tell you briefly the story of Cameron Von Orman uh, and his group over at CA. Uh, so Cameron's background was in the world of development and project management. So he was familiar with Agile as a concept and a practice. And then as he moved more into the world of marketing at CA, he started to wonder if Agile could work with these new sort of marketing folks that he was encountering. Uh, and he was skeptical because there are, of course, pretty significant differences between these small co-located development teams that he was used to working with and a marketing group that is typically big, spread out, in different locations around the world, and they're used to working on campaigns and initiatives that last for a long time. But he was still thought it was worth investigating. Uh, and he kind of lucked out because this, there's three steps to this get big process where he wanted to start small and then wait until he knew he was on the right path before he devoted a whole lot of energy and resources to this and he kind of lucked out in this first step because he was able to start small and strategically when CA acquired a company actually out uh, from where I'm from out in Colorado called Rally Software uh, and they do agile project management. And so when they acquired Rally, the marketers there were already experimenting with agile. And so uh, Cameron was like, you guys just keep doing what you're doing and you can be my test case to see if Agile will work in marketing. And he wanted to start with this kind of initial experiment because he realized that when you go big up front, you could also fail big. So he had about 160 marketers that he was looking after. And if he put them all on hold and said, all right, everybody, we're going Agile this quarter, stop what you're doing, that could be really risky. There could be good benefits to be had, but it would also be kind of a hard sell. And so instead, he wanted to try these low risk increments, like we talked about, that would allow him to safely expand at first. And then once he knew things were going well, he could hit the gas and grow really quickly. So his first step was, like I said, to acquire these marketers who were already practicing Agile and let them do their thing. Um, they were enjoying it, they were getting good results. And so it seemed like a natural step to expand what they were doing 
out to include more of the legacy marketers from CA. So they went from about 20 people in their initial step to out to about 35 in their second step. And it wasn't just adding more people to the experiment. There were a lot of changes that they had to go through. So their first iteration of this was co-located teams. They were all in the same office. And then as they started to expand it out, they had widely distributed teams. So they're in different locations all around the world. And they went from a group of marketers who at least understood Agile because they'd been marketing an Agile tool to a bunch of folks who had no idea what Agile was or why they should care or how they were supposed to use it. They went from marketing a digital product, a SaaS product, to some actual physical on-premises products. And then they went from the single product that they were focusing on at Rally, so just marketing that one piece of software to a whole portfolio of products that were in various stages of their development. So a lot of complexity was introduced as they started to roll this out to more um, parts of the marketing function. I'm curious, you know, for an organization like this and for others on the phone, I think as you're seeing like a big shift in not just how they go to market, but uh, also how they're actually then starting to implement Agile, what, how do you recommend you manage change and get folks on board? Um, do, you, do you talk to customers a lot about change management? Yeah, it definitely has to be part of the discussion. So having a champion like Cameron was is really important. Um, usually it can't be somebody too high up because they're not involved enough in the day to day to understand and advocate for the team. Uh, but somebody who's who's uh, high enough up to have that influence uh, and uh, protect the team a little bit. But it's, you know, it's like I said, it's not a, a quick or easy process and there can be some ups and downs. Um, so understanding change management and what that process looks like and having some um, plans in place for the various obstacles and challenges uh, is really important. Yeah, I actually, it, it always reminds me of uh, a previous company I worked for. Um, we went through a big change to get to more more collaboration. So we implemented a collaboration software so that everyone would get, you know, get out of email hell, as, as I heard someone <laughs> put it, and really get to, to collaborating more across, you know, different regions and things like that. And it was really at, at that organization when I was a part of it, it was, it was both that top down and bottom up change management. So um, at that organization, it was it was smaller. So we had um, a C-level champion and, you know, everything. He just lived and breathed this software. He talked about it. You know, everyone has to use it. You know, this is why. Um, and it was kind of infectious. But he I, I like what you said. You can't just have someone too high up saying it um, because we he also had some kind of individual contributors who are just champions of why we should do this and and why it's so much better to communicate and work faster with more transparency. So it was almost like there were, um, at this organization they had unofficial, but I've talked to other organizations where they have official um, change advocates who are just kind of trained to be advocates. Um, they're all individual contributors and they're spreading the message. Um, and it's really interesting as, as the change, it was really hard at first. Um, but then as you got to get into it, you know, people got really excited about it. And I saw actually the culture changed. And while this was just one very small piece of Agile changing, it was more about um, constant communication and the collaboration. It was funny just even that implementing that one piece of the organization I was with, you know, immediately the culture, I think, started to change because people were on the same page and, and were talking more. Right. Right. And it was really, it's interesting with Cameron and his team because they uh, you're, were seeing this kind of cultural shift, but they also had put in place the ability to actually measure and document what was going on empirically with the team. And so this is sort of that test smart phase of this get big curve where you have to have metrics and measurements in place from the beginning. So let me show you what I mean. So with CA uh, and with Cameron, he wanted to make, make sure that there were, that success could be proven on two fronts. So that it was good for the marketers, good for the team, that they enjoyed it and were happy as in their professional lives with it. And then also, of course, that it was good for the business, good for the bottom line. So 
with that first piece, they do an annual employee satisfaction survey. And so they compared the results pre and post agile marketing. And it was pretty clear that the marketers were really, really happy. So these are all um, in improvements. So a six percentage point increase in uh, reported employee engagement. They're more proud to work for CA. They're 31% more likely to recommend CA as a good place to work. They feel more involved in the decisions affecting their work and they feel more valued as an employee. And you can just imagine what these kind of numbers are gonna do for retention and advocacy of the employees. And not only were they way better year over year for the marketing group that went agile, but they were also better than CA, the average of the other folks at CA. So the marketers are happier than they used to be and they're also overall happier than the rest of the people at CA. So it was pretty clear that yes, that first checkbox, they had the data to prove that the marketers were happy. But they also wanted to know if this was good for business. Are the marketers actually able to bring in more results now that they're agile? And again, they had some excellent metrics and measurement capabilities in place to let them know that they had a 20% improvement in pipeline without a budget increase, that their campaign delivery went from about two months to two weeks, and that they tripled their win rate for marketing sourced opportunities. Uh, it's important to know this is not all uh, chalked up to Agile. They had a couple of other uh, things going on in the marketing department at the same time, but they at least knew that Agile was a contributing factor here. And so they were confident in saying, yes, this is a good idea that's gonna work in our particular organization. And now we're ready to do this last part where we are gonna hit the gas and really finish those last few steps off so that we can get those benefits for every team inside of the CA marketing function. So for them, this meant adding some additional teams. So they ended up with about seven persistent cross-functional campaign teams. So these are teams that stay together all the time working on particular campaigns. And then now they're serving five additional business units. So three steps there, start small, test smart, and grow fast. And finally at CA, it's ended up looking a little bit of something like this. So they have uh, about 100 people now in their agile marketing function on those persistent cross-functional teams and another 60 who are sort of um, their specialists. They retain their specialized skill set and then they just sit with whatever team needs them at any given time. So you can imagine that there's quite a bit of coordination and uh, inter-team planning that has to happen here. So this isn't the sort of thing that you would want to do overnight without first validating and understanding everything that needed to happen. So starting small for them allowed them to get to this place quickly and with minimal risk, which is a, a pretty nice thing to do. Uh, hopefully this is encouraging and makes you want to uh, take that next step. Uh, and if you are intrigued by it at all, I would say now is the time because we found that um, over 60% of traditional teams, traditional marketing teams, are planning an agile transformation of some kind within the next year. Uh, so not to be the fear monger here, but if you don't do it, the likelihood that someone you compete with will do it is pretty high and you don't wanna be playing catch up. So I would recommend uh, taking steps soon to explore this and uh, start down your own agile path as quickly as you can. I'm curious, Andrea, um, so if I'm thinking about getting started with Agile, where would you, you know, you talked about starting small. Um, so does that mean, you know, just start in one department or one region or, or one type, especially for very large organizations? Or does it mean kind of start big, you know, across marketing, but start small with like specific projects or, or specific um, specific areas? So just kind of yeah. curious when you talk about that. Yeah, you could definitely do like a pilot project. I work with teams that do that, um, something with sort of a finite end date so that you have like a time to pause and and exper uh, examine the experiment. Um, really, it's dependent on what seems like it's going to give you good data, you know, about what's a good slice of the marketing function that we could pull off and go agile with and to, to know if this is a good idea uh, and how, <clears throat> excuse me, how we would need to 
develop our own hybrid approach to work because everybody's context is a little different and there's no like copy paste abilities here. Um, so thinking about who would be good, what kind of projects would be good, what's the cross section that we would need to, to know if this is a good path for us is really, um, that's the kind of like nebulous, well, answer that, uh, that people, people don't really like to hear, but unfortunately that's how it works. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love, you know, especially for really big organizations that are resistant to change. I found that pilot programs work well because it's like you get the people who are most excited about it on board. You measure, measure, um, you know, the benefits they've seen. And it, it kind of I found that, you know, people don't always listen to ideas or they're resistant to ideas. But when you show them the real benefits, that's when their ears start to perk up or, or they actually so you know especially if you're resistant I think you know that kind of starting with a smaller pilot if you have that resistant culture in your organization that can be really well received right right yeah and having the right people like you said the people who are actually excited about it makes a big difference because trying to drag somebody through this process is uh is quite painful <laughs> absolutely well, great. I think uh, you know we can probably open up to open it up to questions. Um, you know, I think I, I do want to make a little bit of a plug. I don't, I don't know if Ed, you want to add, add anything else, but we're doing a follow up webinar um, to this one on March 27th at one Eastern. Um, so, you know, today we really talked about why agile marketing and why it's important and how others have been successful. Um, on the 27th, we'll just go a little bit deeper on. Um, what type of marketing organization is required to enable agile marketing and more details about how they get started. Um, so if you're kind of bought into the vision but don't really know where to get started, I think this is a great next step on um, March 27th. So I'll pass yeah. it back to Ed if he wants to uh, facilitate some of the Q&A. That's awesome. Andrea, Anjali, amazing. Like uh, we've, we've been talking about uh, agile marketing for years, but the, the fact that years have gone by and people have learned uh, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, this is truly something, it, you guys used one word, it's deliberate. It, it just doesn't happen by accident. You honestly have to hit the pause button, learn this, the available methodologies, the various flavors, the ice cream flavors that are out there, get educated, understand what that means, the philosophy, the mindset, the processes, really immerse yourself in it and then put it into play and you know marry it up marry that business discipline that mindset with the right technologies to get up and going and um, really great proof points in here uh, you know when i think about organization marketing organizations that kind of feel stuck or something's getting in the way this seems to be the right uh, way area to look in terms of transforming or disrupting old ways of getting to market uh, so very powerful so thank you um, so yeah, definitely some questions that came in here. Uh, first one, you know, in terms of, so Andrea, let's get you on these. Um, in terms of, you know, sizes of organizations, right? There's marketing organizations anywhere from three people all the way up to sort of the mega major marketing machines out there of the Fortune uh, and Global, um, Global 1500, et cetera, where there's, you know, internal marketing, uh, internal marketing organizations and agencies. Uh, how does it, I guess the question would be, can it scale for the small organizations and the large organizations? Yes, it absolutely can scale, um, but it does have to be, as you said, the deliberate process. So it can start off in a really small portion of the marketing function uh, and really small teams can make this work. But then as it becomes time to scale, that's really when the technology has to be there. Because you can't, I mean, the, the whiteboard is really nice in the early days, the whiteboard and sticky notes, um, but you won't get the metrics there and you won't get the cross team visibility. Uh, planning can be really complicated with those kinds of um, analog tools. So the scaling really relies on the technology as well as the culture. So you're starting to, you know, um, move from a single co-located unit probably to lots of different units you're incorporating agencies they need visibility into the process and they need to understand how their relationship with the company is going to change now that agile is part of the equation uh, so communication visibility and the right technology um, are definitely 
key pillars to to making this work uh, at scale. Excellent. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, more wow, the questions just keep pumping in here. So next one has to do with interruptions. Um, if we get asked to do something by someone outside of the team, how do we handle that? I, it just like the nature of marketing is constant interruption. So what are your recommendations on with this methodology? How does it help the marketer? Yeah, um, so Agile is really nice because it does give us permission to say no to these uh, emergencies, quote unquote, uh, whether they're real emergencies or imagined ones. Uh, because we do release things so often, whether it's, you know, at the end of the next sprint or you're doing a continuous delivery style with more of a Kanban flow, something's going to be coming out really soon. The team will finish something very soon, which means that they can take on this new request very soon. We don't have to say, well, that wasn't part of our quarterly plan, so we can't touch it for three months. You know, nobody likes to hear that. And so Agile both lets us say no, but it also allows us to take things into our process more rapidly. Um, if it is a true emergency, you know, something's happened, right? We need to jump on a PR opportunity or a PR crisis, and we have to make adjustments, then that's okay. The process is designed to allow for rapid pivoting and things like that, as long as we are careful about not letting it become a habit and not taking it into the flow without taking something else out. You know, we can't just keep adding and adding. There's always got to be that debate and discussion about where does this fall in the team's priorities. And having everything out in the open makes those kinds of discussions uh, a lot less painful and a lot less personal as well. Absolutely. Wow. And that takes a lot of the emotional energy out of work, which is awesome, right? Because in marketing, we can get fatigued by all this distraction, disruption, and constant pivoting. But if we have process frameworks, these mental frameworks to point to, to say, here's how we're, we will handle it and here's how we're going to handle it. Then you can get back to business and, and stay productive and conserve emotional and honestly physical energy within the team. Uh, those are strong points. Um, so next question here, um, do we need a formal agile leader like a scrum master on our team in order to uh, move forward with this? Um. I think the short answer there is probably not, uh, not a not a traditional scrum master, mostly because of that slide that I showed early on that most marketing teams actually don't end up using pure scrum. And so sending someone to a scrum master training and getting them to act as like the scrum master, the, the person who is in charge of making sure the team does scrum better is not necessarily a good use of everybody's time and energy. Um, shameless plug coming up here, we are offering um, an actual Agile marketing certification at Agile Sherpas that we've worked with the International Consortium for Agile to design the curriculum. So it's very rigorous um, and in line with the larger business agility um, track that they have over there. So this would be the kind of thing that I think is more beneficial to marketers rather than getting like an actual Scrum certification just because you're probably not going to stick with Scrum for very long, even if you start there. And so you don't want to confine yourself unnecessarily. But having an advocate and a leader whose job it is to make sure that Agile uh, stays at the forefront and that continuous improvement is happening uh, can be really valuable, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a formalized role. Gotcha. Excellent. And more questions here. Uh, these actually, these next questions have to do with technology. Uh, and I'll handle these. So Kevin asked a question, um, are we going to show a primo and how it can facilitate uh, agile uh, project management? The answer is yes, but not today. Um, we'll do that in the next webinar. And also Sandy, is um, any suggestion on programs that help facilitate agile? Very similar question. So really it's what are the technologies that can help enable? So we'll absolutely get to that. And then um, uh, Vicky asks, can we send the deck? Absolutely, <laughs> we'll send this information around. Um, so that you can share with your leadership team. Um, and absolutely, Andrew just came in here. Uh, can you get, can we get a copy of the recorded webinar? Absolutely, we'll get we'll hit your inbox with it. Uh, so th this was honestly great. And um, uh, Andrea and Anjali, you guys are the A team. No pun intended there with uh, <laughs> with Agile as a topic, but fantastic. Uh, and if you want to get more. Um, actually, Andrea, we're going to be in Las Vegas uh, together with Agile Sherpas and a Primo in a couple weeks. 
That's right. That's right. We're doing book signings and um, we're all talking Agile. So come on out to Vegas and uh, geek out on Agile with us. Absolutely. That is the term. We will be geeking out on Agile. And actually at Prima, we'll be launching some new product capabilities uh, around uh, being Agile with content, being Agile with planning and process. Um, so if you can book a ticket out to Vegas, join us at the Intelligent Content Conference. And uh, yeah, Andrea, Anjali, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, knowledge and experience and ideas today. Thank you very much. And uh, if you all are listening and have questions further, uh, I'm Andrea at AgileSherpas.com. Always happy to answer any further questions. And of course, hit up Anjali. She's always very active on social media as well. At a what are you saying about me, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> Feel free, feel free as well. If you have any questions about a primo, our point of view, or any questions about what we talked about today, I'm also happy to, to answer. Absolutely. Let's keep that conversation going. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for taking some time out of your, your super busy days and joining us. And uh, we'll see you soon. Cheers.